lot of the same people, so it was great to come here and get a ju juicy jolt of gossip. <laughs> because that's what writing really is. It's, it's juicy jolts of gossip made beautiful. <laughs> yeah, all, all the time you, you, you think you're gossiping, just use it. Go ahead and use it. Now, some of the readings that I do are Jeff Buckley, and some are Kool and the Gang. I'm going to give you the Kool and the Gang reading. <laughs> I really have enjoyed being here, so, you know, celebration is on a loop in my head. <laughs> There's a party going up. You know. <laughs> use, it, use it in spin class, and every time I thought I was too tired, that song would come on. So, I, as Becky mentioned, and I want to thank all the faculty here. I want to, like, take you all home with me because you're so much fun, and you're so funny, and, and do y'all have little name badge. <laughs> I want a name badge. Cheers. Can I have an honorary one? Okay. Um, but back home, I, I do um, help direct the MFA program at Southern Illinois. And one of the things we do is our third year MFA students, our program is three years long, and our third year MFA students, we send them off into the world with a, um, a reading we call our gala. And the reading is always lovely. People get dressed up. But what everybody really wants is the after party. <laughs> and I'm always at the after party trying to make people dance. Because I have this belief that poets should dance. Even if you dance poorly. You know, poetry's all about rhythm, so even if you look like Frankenstein out there, you, you have to get up and do your thing. So this poem is called Why Poets Should Dance. Why Poets Should Dance. Not sufficient to count syllables, break lines and say you're done. Stanzas need sweat and the solar plexus, heat and heartbeats, thud of speakers blowing out timidity, shaking loose the cliches from your hair. Boogie is both noun and verb for a reason. Blessings of motion do you on both page and stage. How else? Will you get your poems to flow if you don't let your backbone slip? If you don't subscribe to groove theory? And I don't want to hear that you can't feel that flow because you are white. <laughs> All white. <laughs> Poster board. Rhythm knows no color. Drums come in all sizes, and all posteriors are beautiful. <laughs> so says my muse, and you don't want to mess with her. Switchblades in her afro, stilettos on her feet. She will urge the divine dance upon you. Send it through your fingers, hips, shoulders. Lean into her, into me. I will take you there, sugar in my shimmy, funk in my footsteps. <laughs> so I wrote this book, and it's a really depressing book. It's a book about, it's a book about elegies for my father. Um, and we had not the best relationship. Uh, and there is that series of sonnets in there. But I thought I would read a poem that um, generally I don't read because it, it applies to what we've been talking about this entire time which is, how do you decide what genre you're going to write in? We've heard fiction, we've heard poetry. Um, how much of our fictions, fictions with an S on the end, in parentheses, how much of our fictions are true? How much of our truth is fiction? I really wanted to have the freedom in this book to elegize without making it documentary. So this is, this is a bill now. It's called, On Not Wanting to Write a Memoir. What's there to write? I had the kind of use I'll need the breath of life to figure out. Forgive me if I won't tell you the truth. My memory is insecure. I have no proof that what I say is true. There's always doubt. What's there to write? I had the kind of youth where memory is a shifting realm. We moved before I knew what moving was about. Forgive me if I won't tell you the truth. Three countries, three households, three roofs, 
Three homes where I could play or fall or pout. What's there to write? I have the kind of youth that surfaces in dreams, not tamed, uncouth, each fear or happiness of equal clout. Forgive me if I won't tell you the truth. Some memories were deep in bone and tooth, with consequences I can do without. What's there to write? I had that kind of youth. Forgive me if I don't tell you the truth. Everybody knows where Jamaica is. They're like, Bob Marley, boy and the prophet. Yes, that's me. <laughs> My dad was from an island called Karyaku, and he actually grew up in an island called Grenada, which if people remember at all, it's that we invaded it once, like to the half a day or something. Um, but they met and married in London, England, because my mother had gone there for her nurse's training, uh, and my father had gone there to be an electrician. And one of the interesting things that people don't think about, um, the, there's an equivalency to the American Great Migration in Caribbean people that they left their islands to go to either the United States, England, or Canada and become members of those countries. So my family moved from the Caribbean to the UK to Canada, and finally I ended up growing up, and doing my growing up in the Bronx. So here I was, this kid from the Bronx who loved pizza and the Yankees. And I had these really post-colonial parents. <laughs> like, I didn't know what they were talking about half the time. Part of it was, was the accent, which, which I can delve into, you know, I can say it. But the other more difficult part was their love for all things British. So this is a, a poem about translation. And after I wrote it, I realized that it's also generational, that we, all of us don't understand what our parents <coughs> are saying, no matter where it is they came from. Translating my parents. When my father would growl, wash the wares now. I always thought he'd said, W-E-D-S, learn to move to the sink quickly in terror, knew his order meant wash the dishes right away and don't use too much soap. And when mother asked me to put serviettes on the table, I knew she meant set the table, use napkins, the paper kind. What sort of English was this that they spoke so surely an odd lingo of strange terms like brawly and dustbin for umbrella and trash can, flannel instead of washcloth, clim soles instead of sneakers, baffled by their love of fish and chips, crisps and crumpets. I wondered why they drank tea instead of coffee, why my father downed Guinness instead of Miller High Life, making me sip that dark, bitter stout, laughing as I grimaced, wrinkling my eight-year-old nose. I couldn't imagine them living in any other country but this one, in any other house but this one. Couldn't imagine the house of my birth, 289 Whiteman Road, London Borough of Haringey. The only borough I knew was the Bronx. And there an elevator was an elevator, not a lift. A cookie was a cookie, not a biscuit. <laughs> and no one dared call sausage and potatoes bangers and mash. <laughs> I learned to translate their dialect into an English I could recognize. So when my father nagged, write a Z and write it properly. I knew he truly meant write a Z as in zipper, as in zero, and write it plainly so I can read it. Now I've come full circle because I've realized that the best chocolate is British. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will kill a 
bitch for some UK shop. <laughs>
writers, poets, editors, we do all this stuff. And we've managed to be together for over 25 years without killing each other, <laughs> which is an amazing thing when you think of two writers. And he's a very different writer than I am, not stylistically necessarily, but in method and execution. I, I write on anything. There are scraps falling off of me and out of my pockets. There, I discover poems that I didn't know I wrote a year after I wrote them. He writes in his head. He keeps poems up there for years, and when he finally sits down at the screen, they're nearly finished because he's been composing in his head all the time. It's a good thing that he's like that because I create enough chaos all on myself. But I wanted to write a poem about our relationship. So this is called Terzanel for Two Writers. Terzanel is a, a Villanelle variation. It's Terzarima married to the Villanelle form. Um, so this is for him, and I wish that he were here because the Jallison show is really entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing uh, several joint readings lately, so it feels, I feel sort of incomplete. Turns an L for two writers, for John. I love it when you leave me home to write, and I love it when you come back home again. To read the words I stumble on at night, new turns of phrase both beautiful and plain. Bits from our past demanding to be told. I love it when you come back home again, reminding me I'm happy growing old if you'll be there to edit all my lines. <laughs> Joint memories demanding to be told. A past I try to constantly refine while scribbling something more than memory. Since you'll be here to edit all my lines, keep me from language grown too flowery. I write until your key turns in our door. To scribble something more than memory takes both of us, no less, no more, to read the words I stumble on by night. I write until your key turns in our door, so confident you'll leave me home to write. And that's, that's one of the things about being married to another writer. They will leave you the hell alone when you need to be left the hell alone. <laughs> it's like, can I see? Can I see? He doesn't do that. He understands that, you know, okay, she's writing, I will leave her alone. <laughs> so I'm going to read a few more poems. <coughs> Not really about her, but in the style of. Um, when in doubt, just rip somebody off. <laughs> or write an answer poem. And one of my literary idols is Dorothy Parker, who um, many people see her as a tragic figure, and many people think of her verse as light. I think of it as very evil. You know, just the men in her life were just awful to her. So she has a poem called A Ballade at 35, and a ballade is a, an elaborate uh, French form. And I wanted to write an answer poem. I like doing that. I like, when I, there's a poem that I particularly love, I write an answer or a sequel. Um, this is called The Cost. This no song of a cranky witch, this no saga sweetly sung, this no played out movie pitch, no demo for the hip and young. I've come unwrapped been tightly strung. I've railed at inequality, climbed ladders with unsteady rungs. No woman gets through life for free. This no chance of an angry bitch. This no treatise newly sprung. I've had due time to soothe each itch. I've swung some bells and had mine swung. Worn out my hands, my eyes, my tongue. Been added by my history, cracked pieces I have toiled among. No woman gets through life for free. I've had my years to writhe and twitch. Those days when air seeped from my lungs, each hollow lived more like a ditch. I've been seduced and I've been stung. I've been the woman who has hung up on herself maliciously. These are the words to which I've clung. No woman gets through life for free. Clean
cleaned up the scattered showers I've flung, picked up my bags, my dark debris. What have I learned when all is slung? No woman gets through life for free. I'm going to close with a poem about music <coughs> because I like to sing, but I don't ever remember enough of the song. <laughs> so I substitute by writing poems about music. And uh, before John and I settled in to our lives in Parkerdale, we lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is his hometown. And um, we were at a musical festival once, and we saw a group called the Sounds of Blackness. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Sounds of Blackness, but what they do is they take African American musical history and animate it through uh, choral performance. And, it started as a on-campus musical group at McAllister College, which is in Minnesota, not known for having a lot of black folk. <laughs> but I find the places where you see us least are often the places where we make the most impact. So I struggled with whether I'm a religious person or whether I care to argue even if there is such thing as a divine presence, but when something this splendid hits you, there is no way you are not going to have happy feet. And I don't mean penguins. <laughs> so again, I want to thank everyone here at Francis Marion for having me as part of this festival. This is called In the Spirit, on seeing the sounds of blackness perform Riverfront Park. My body sways in a kind of joy I never thought I'd know, feet unmindful of where they land. Moving to please themselves, my arms above my head wanting to embrace this music, to pull these resonant voices into my own body so I'd always hear such profound basses, triumphant sopranos, this blending and melding of low and high tones, turning each song into an ocean that surges above me, thrilling with wave after celebratory wave. I thought I was immune to gospel, to hymns and spirituals, but these knowing faces, these swelling vocals, I cannot resist them, cannot stop my body from swaying along when the soloist steps forth to give us her richest notes, her voice ascending and ascending into realms I never dared believe in, places I glimpsed, if only for this moment, this confluence of organ, tambourine, and these many mighty voices, this choir undaunted by the pain in the music of a people. Slave songs, work chants, passionate songs of praise that soothe and sustain, giving solace to even a doubter like me, a woman who never before danced in public, a woman who is now dancing with every ounce of spirit she has, snapping fingers, clapping hands, moving hips to the music of this multitude, the very voices Boying her up, making her know God. Thank you. Summer 
uh, teen writing workshop. So I am very interested in how the creative process works. I'm very interested in how people get ideas for writing, how we generate ideas when we feel we are stuck, uh, how we um, create a dialogue between writers of different genres. So that's something that's of real interest and importance to me. Um, I teach a variety of courses. I teach workshops, which may or may not be effective. I'm coming more and more to realize that not everybody is going to benefit from this system in which we sit around and share manuscripts and, and talk about the merits of a poem that may never see the light of day. What I'm interested in now is a class that I'm going to teach, and I've taught it uh, consecutively for the past couple of years, a class about the forms of poetry. And first of all, what does that mean? Does that mean just sonnets and traditional forms? As the class has expanded for me, I start talking about, of course, at the beginning, sonnets and traditional forms, and I write in those forms, but also occasional forms, invented forms, odes, acrostics, all these wonderful ways that we can keep ourselves writing poetry when we think we can't write another poem. Um, I don't necessarily value form over content, but form is also a way to get me to content that I might not have ever ventured into. Um, Jane Yolen, earlier today, was talking about her book of sonnets that literally, it sounded like she wrote them as her husband was dying, as he was receiving radiation treatment for can cancer. And that struck a chord with me because the poems in my father's kites are elegies that I wrote in sonnet form because I felt there's no other form that's going to allow me to get through this material. So I really like turning people on to various forms, inventing my own forms, and I always joke that that forms class might be the only poetry class someone would have to take, because if they keep on thinking at sort of at an architectural level and I give them this, these tools, whatever content they want to fill their poems with, they know how to structure it. They know, why should this poem be in a set meter and this one be in free verse, and what are the advantages and disadvantages? They can think architecturally about their own poems, which I think is a really good thing to do for another, another writer. So I, I just love teaching poetry in particular. Um, and one of the things, I'll give you an exercise from my, um, pedagogy class. Uh, the students in the class are creative writing MFA students. They have usually not yet taught creative writing, but they have taken creative writing classes, either as undergraduates or, of course, as graduate students. So we do workshop simulations where everyone, we role play. So one student will be that kid in creative writing class who always thinks he's smarter than the teacher. <laughs> and another graduate student will be the kid in creative writing class who never says anything and does this. That way we sort of replicate the dynamics of what a workshop can be and talk about how effective it can be and how not effective it can be. And so it's a really interesting um, exercise that we do in the pedagogy class. But yeah, I'm crazy about this field of creative writing pedagogy. Um, and I talk a lot about it. Out there for questions. So, you know, I mentioned to you yesterday that I, I feel like I don't know a lot about poetry. And I know a lot of fiction writers who, who also will admit that to you in a quiet room. <laughs> but I do love to buy poetry collections for poets. I love to hear poets read. I just really enjoy your reading. My question is, you, both you and Evie have given us these recommendations of who to read, mm -hmm. which has been great for me because I didn't know these names. How do we, as consumers who want to support poets, find new poets mm -hmm. and, and support them? If, for example, we don't have a lot of poetry readings happening in our mm -hmm. area, how do we find out who we need to be reading? Because sometimes it's just able to it go is, to the spot. It is if you don't live in a, a large metropolitan area, it's hard. But Evie mentioned Poetry Daily and Verse Daily, which are um, websites that reprint poems from literary journals from around, uh, really around the world. And sometimes you can just find someone, sorry, 
oh, I've never heard of this Marcus Wicker Jew, but I love this poem. Um, it was just on Poetry Daily. It's, um, it's not difficult if you like friend every poet on Facebook as well, because we're always telling you where we're going to be. <laughs> I get invited to readings I can't possibly go to. <laughs> but I love knowing that in any major and a lot of smaller American cities, at campuses and in bars, in somebody's living room, somebody's reading poems. But it is hard to sort of figure out, okay, who's next? But it's good to know, know people like us will say, okay, here's, here's what I want you to read. Here's, here's, here's the person you need to go see. Because some people work on the page, some people work when you hear them. We can like give you the dirty and the skinny and all of that. But it is it is wonderful to know that just about any place you go to, there are going to be some poets somewhere reading something. I just whenever anyone says, you know, poetry is a dying art, it's like, okay, why am I getting all these invitations then? I was going to ask about writer's block. You mm -hmm. mentioned formal forms as a way to kind of mm -hmm. get over that. Are there any other treatments for, for writer's block that you would my, my main thing is that I will write about anything. Mm -hmm. You know, just seeing that phrase, emergency librarian, it's like, what would an emergency librarian be? I will write about, there are things that I write about that are that immediate, like I see it and I want to write about it. But then there are things that I tell as stories for years, and then I realized, I should have just written a poem. Like the story of John and me meeting, for years I would tell as a joke with a punchline, and I finally wrote the poetic version of it, <laughs> and I hope, I'm hoping it'll be in the next book. But the joke with the punchline is, we were at one of those old graduate students meeting the new graduate students party, which always involved a large K. <laughs> And I sit down next to him, and I say, Hi, my name is Allison, what's yours? I'm 21, okay, so give me a pass. <laughs> and he's sitting there, and what I didn't know at the time was that he was drunk and had been nursing his buzz all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I'm like, I'm from the Bronx, where are you from? And I'm reaching my hand up to shake his hand, and he says, Little Rock, Arkansas, and I literally pull my hand back <laughs> and say, Little Rock, Arkansas? Like the only image that came through my head at that moment was a little black girl getting spat upon. <laughs> and he was cool, he said, yeah. Central High, 1957, he gave me the right answer right back at me, which was, I acknowledge this history. I know this painting. And uh, I finally wrote the poetic version of it, which it, it turns into a tender moment in the poem. But I've been telling this as a joke for years. So I just look at my own damn jokes. <laughs> you know? Like the stories we've been telling for years, they need to go somewhere. They need to go somewhere. So they end up in my poems. And I do that with John because there are stories he's told me for years about working in the movie theater industry, which is partially responsible for how polite he is, because he's dealt with irate people for all those years before becoming an academic. So I've told him, you need to write these movie theater poems for me. One of the poems I wanted him to write, his last name is Fribble. So the local Star Trek club wanting him to, at one of the premieres of one of the Star Trek films, wanted him to stand there with a Fribble on his shoulder from the Trouble with Tribbles episode. I said, that, you've got to write that poem. <laughs> I'm not thinking until you do it. So the story is the things that we tell ourselves, our obsessions, our dreams. I am not one of those people that writes down dreams, but a lot of people get a lot of material out of dreams. I tend to write down just little things that I observe rather than dreams and trying to chance meetings and things that I don't think initially are important. I'll scribble them down and hopefully later on they're significant. They accrue significance over time. Yes? Music is obviously a big part of what inspired you. 
uh, what's your favorite kinds of music? And do you listen to music when you write or do you need silence? I don't usually listen to music when I write, but there are a lot of musical influences. And I like music as subject matter um, because it adds this layer of interest for people who might not read poetry. So I have a poem in Imitation of Life where, and I actually wrote this before my dad died, where I send him to heaven and the person he wants to find is uh, Louis Armstrong because he always talked about Satchel. Okay. It's a music poem, but it's also a family poem. I love thinking about poets as semi-musicians because we do have a certain music that we're trying to portray. Um, but I listen to anything and everything. I listen to things that I don't want to admit to. <laughs> I listen to the serious singer-songwriters who gaze off on their album cover. <laughs> I had super rare disco, I mean like regional disco, <laughs> I had an 80s child, late 70s, 80s child, so, and even things that I don't understand, like my father had this deep, deep love of classical music, I've tried, because I've tried to write about that, it's like why does this black man love classical music so much, and you find something lacking in his own education or life that he had to become, again, European. Um, I do wonder if there's ever going to be a poet who's as popular as Lady Gaga, you know. Because in other, other countries around the world, people turn out for poetry readings like they're rock concerts. I'm like, I want that. <laughs> mm, but in those countries, people get turned, thrown in jail to uh, maybe not. You can wear dress made out of meat or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Well, thank you so much.